Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. In this crooked game of power politics here in America, the Negro, namely the race problem, integration, civil rights issue, are all nothing but tools used by the whites who call themselves liberals against another group of whites who call themselves conservatives, either to get into power or to retain power. Among whites here in America, the political teams are no longer divided into Democrats and Republicans. The whites who are now struggling for control of the American political throne are divided into liberal and conservative camps. The white liberals from both parties cross party lines to work together toward the same goal. And white conservatives from both parties do likewise. The white liberal differs from the white conservative only in one way. The liberal is more deceitful, more hypocritical than the conservative. Both want power, but the white liberal is the one who has perfected the art of posing as the Negro's friend and benefactor. And by winning the friendship and support of the Negro, the white liberal is able to use the Negro as a pawn or a weapon in this political football game that is constantly raging between the white liberals and the white conservatives. The American Negro is nothing but a political football, and the white liberals control this ball through tricks or tokenism, false promises of integration and civil rights. In this game of deceiving and using the American Negro, the white liberals have complete cooperation of the Negro civil rights leader, who sell our people out for a few crumbs of token recognition, token gains, token progress. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ba'd. In the name of Allah, and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon the messenger of Allah as to what follows. Brothers and sisters, Haters and hatets, <laughs> I welcome you back to another episode of The Features with love and serenity in my heart, no hatred at all. And I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon all of you. And before we begin, please hit the like button, please hit the share button, please hit the subscribe button, and please don't forget to support. Uh, your brother on Patreon. As you know, we develop a lot of haters here. <laughs> All right. So, to quickly uh, recap of what we've done already in this series. So, we established already that Daniel Hakikachu has very strong alt right leanings. And we also established that the left right paradigm is actually, you know, part of a system which is holding up uh, white supremacy. So it doesn't make a difference if you're right-leaning, left-leaning. It has, both sides have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with Islam. And <clears throat> participating in that system, that democratic system is only uh, used to prop up white supremacy. And <clears throat> in the previous series that I did, we established that these um, rabbit hole, okay, this new hypocrisy dawa, okay, they have they use certain language and certain epithets and insults for black scholarship, black duat, and black people. For example, the brother Wajji, as you can see here, <laughs> right, <laughs> losing his mind, <laughs> calling me all kinds of races and stuff. And there's a reason and there's a purpose for that. Because as you can see, Daniel Hokikuchu has very strong alt-right white supremacist uh, pandering. He, I mean, it's blatantly obviously obvious. And they have said absolutely nothing about that. Because that language of carefully picking your words and using good language, that's for those people. 
For us, black people, we get a different language. We get called racist when we stand up for our people. And this is what you have to understand, you know? So for, for you, black people, you have to understand that. And you are the one who has to, you're the ones who have to make your decisions and your plans based upon the way that these people act. Because not everybody in a, in a thobe in, your beard, in a beard is your brother. I'm sorry. You can take it from me now, or you can take it from me 20 years from now. That's why they use this language for me with the epithets, the racist, even though I never talked about race. Three videos. Three videos. I never talked about race. And even recently, that, that new one that you just saw there, where he's calling me racist, that was today, right? So he let a whole week pass without saying not a single thing about Danny Hakikachu. And then after a week, when a certain video comes up, he's ready to call me racist again. That's for us. You understand, black people? That language is for us. And the reason why they do that, as he said, not me, in the videos that I posted before in that previous series, because he does not want to see black unity amongst the black do what he said that as he said over and over again uniting with your boys you know because he's black I, did i mention race no i didn't mention any of that it was him who was mentioning that that's what they're afraid of and you have to understand that and this is proof right here with uh this exposure of uh how you have somebody openly pandering to white supremacy and they don't have a single word to say against white supremacy even though black people are always in the forefront whether it's palestine whether it's um syria whether it's the uyghurs whether it's rohingya whether it's lebanon we are always right there all the time no matter what it is for other muslim countries and ethnic groups we are always in the front defending our muslim brothers but when it comes to us and our issues we are not allowed to do that because we are racist if we do that you need to understand that point you need to understand that point and i will always do the point once allah has wrapped you in this black skin and given you these full black lips and this full uh black nose once you've done once Allah has given you that automatically the world will look at you in a certain way and that's how they see us you understand we are supposed to be on the bottom because we are wrapped in this skin so <clears throat> either we accept that as a people as our place on the bottom never to fight white supremacy, never to have a land or a nation of our own, never to, never to unite and live under the feet of other races for our entire existence until Yom Kiyama, or we can fight, we can unite, we can do something about it. It all depends on what, who you want to listen to. I've been fighting racism since I started, uh, since I left, <coughs> you know, refuting Troy and Spunks those guys. This is what I've been doing fighting racism you know what i mean but again that language is for us so now i want to get into the introduction of this new video <clears throat> the first part of it i want to talk about sheikh uh taher wyatt for a minute now sheikh taher wyatt as i mentioned before many times you know i didn't listen to too many of his lectures but every single time I listen to his lectures every time. Wallahi fa'ida. Fa'ida. And I mentioned this before several times. And it's not because I don't like his lectures that I have. No, actually, I like his lectures very, very much. But because when you listen to somebody like Sheikh Tahir Wyatt, he really reminds me a lot of when I, the times I used to listen, listen to Sheikh Albani, rahimullah. Because every lecture you, you listen to Sheikh Albani, <clears throat> Excuse me, you're going to learn something, you're going to benefit something for the rest of your life. Sheikh Tahar White, why he's kind of like that. So, for example, Allahumma innaka afu wa tahibu afu fa afu anna. 
right? This is the dua you say in uh, the last days of, uh, of Ramadan, you know, and oh Allah, you are the one who forgives, or you are, you are Afu, you're the forgiver or the pardoner, and you love to pardon, so Afu Anna, so for, pardon us, right? I learned this dua from Tahir Wyatt, okay, off of his videos. And uh, you know, like, uh, you know, we depend on Allah. There's nothing worthy of worship except for him. We put our trust in him and he's the Lord of the, the great throne. I learned this dua from Tahir Wyatt. You see what I'm saying? So every single time I'm, I'm listening to him, I'm getting something that I'm, t I'm taking for the rest of my life. You know, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdi. You know, uh, this dua again. I learned it from Sheikh Tahir Wyatt, and all these duas I'm learning from Tahir Wyatt, I'm teaching my family. So if I'm listening to Tahir Wyatt, if I'm sitting down and listening to Tahir Wyatt, I'm not just you know just listening for. No, it's not entertaining. You're actually getting something you're gonna take with you. For the rest of your life, that's the difference between, uh, you know, a sheikh, like a legit sheikh, right, or a YouTuber, right? You know what I mean? You're not wasting your time when you're listening to Sheikh Tahir, right? Uh, and, you know, so Sheikh Tahir, when he has his lessons, you know, and I'm doing this with me and my family, I'm taking the dua and whatever, memorizing it. My family's memorizing it. We're saying it after, um, you know, the salat, you know the uh, Fajr and the Maghrib Salat, or doing it together or whatnot, like if he gets the same reward that I'm getting because he taught me this, and, and in return, I taught my family this. You see what I'm saying? That is a sheikh, right? So, when and also the other thing when you're listening to Sheikh Tahir Hawaii, you notice that he doesn't speak about anybody. So when he spoke about uh, Daniel Hakikachu, and again, he he didn't say that Daniel Kingers was a liar. What he said, what he, he said was uh, he is uh, academically dishonest. Okay. No, you know, you have to think, well, why would Sheikh Tahir why say something like this? You know what I mean? And point two, right? Which is about scholarship. Scholarship is not something that's arbitrary, okay? You don't just wake up one day and you're a scholar. Scholarship is something that uh, requires years and years and years of study and training and practice and even lecturing and teaching, right? It, it, it's something that is in, it happens in levels until you reach the level of scholar, right? So for centuries, of course, there's going to be um, differing and who is a scholar, who's not a scholar, but it's not arbitrary. You know, there's some training involved in scholarship. So when uh, Abu Omar and uh, Sheikh Abu Tawba, they differed on whether or not Umar Suleiman is a scholar, then the first question you have to ask yourself, which I ask myself, well, well why is uh, Sheikh Abu Tawbah calling Umar Suleiman a scholar, right? Because maybe he knows something that we don't know. But what the people did is just automatically assume that Sheikh Abu Tawbah doesn't know what he's talking about, right? And that's not that's not a correct approach because either the like for me, for example, I say for example, uh, Umar Suleiman is not a scholar. But why am I saying that? It's because I never heard another scholar saying that he's a scholar, right? But it doesn't mean that he's not a scholar. It's just based upon what I know. Maybe Sheikh Abu Talib knows something that we don't know. You see, you see what I'm getting at? So, for example, Imam Bayhaki, uh, rahimahullah, he's Imam, right? He's Imam of Ahlul Sunnah, but he was an Ashari. He was an Ashari, right? Sarahatan, like. You know, 100%. And us as Salafis, or the, the people from who are upon the menhaj of the Salaf, we're always fair in our assessment of scholarship, right? So we call him Imam. He's an Imam, even though he's an Ashari. You understand? So we're fair in our assessment of the people. 
right? Just because somebody differs with us in Akita or whatever doesn't take away from their scholarship. Why? Because scholarship is worked for. It's attained. It's achieved through levels. You understand? So, inshallah, I'm going to tie the two. So I want you to uh, watch something first, inshallah. And this is another thing I want to move on is that we hear a lot of criticism that you have no knowledge and you have studied no Islamic uh, sciences. You just, you know, you just uh, hodgepodge making things up. Uh, you have very little understanding. So can I, you know, ask you, um, uh, you know, to be honest and see what kind of, you know, Islamic sciences have you studied? Yes, mashallah, you've done your studies of Harvard, secular, etc. But can you give us some enlightenment on this uh, Islamic sciences, please? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I just want to note an irony, though, that uh, my credentials are only questioned when I criticize uh, certain figures. Uh, prior to that, they're really not looking at credentials. In fact, some of the people who now say that I have no credentials, I have no credibility uh, to speak at all about Islam, these are the same people that uh, gave me positions at their institutes and were actually inviting me to speak uh, and so forth. But then when they're the ones who are being criticized, uh, then suddenly my credentials are at issue. And I find it, uh, you know, ironic. Like, I'll say that uh, I might criticize someone for participating in a uh, pagan ritual, uh, uh, an imam participating in a pagan ritual, and then my credentials are, are in question instead of that imam's credentials. So remember when Sheikh um, Tahir Wyatt, he said that the brother Danny Hokikiju is academically, academically dishonest. And then thousands of you went to Daniel Hakikachu's whatever, Facebook, whatever, <laughs> started calling him a liar, right? <laughs> Sheikh Tahir Hawaii didn't ask you to do that, right? And again, these, these are reactionary things that, you know, we sh just should not be doing. If Sheikh Tahir Hawaii is saying something, you should be pay attention to what he's saying and see if it's true. Now, Sheikh Tahir Wyatt, he said that thing, right? But the example that he gave was just not a good example. But this over here, this is a good example of being academically uh, dishonest because he is prefacing, first of all, the question is, you know, what is your Islamic you know, studies? And he's prefacing that, right? Why? Because he wants to make uh, Umar Suleiman look in a certain light, like, you know what I mean? Like, nobody's questioning him after he goes and does this pagan ritual. You see? But that wasn't the question. You know what I mean? Furthermore, at the end, he said, uh, nobody questions this imam. Well, let's say, for example, I want to question that imam. I want to find out what his credentials actually are. Is he a sheikh? Is he a scholar or not? And remember what I said, that scholarship is not arbitrary. It's something that is worked for. It's something that you have to exert yourself and attain. You understand? So let's go see what, if we can find, if it's possible that we can find uh, uh, Omar Suleiman's credentials. So here, as you can see, I typed in Google, Umar Suleiman, Islamic credentials, as simple as that. And then you see the top three links here. You have one in Wikipedia, one in Yakin Institute, and one in Al-Maghrib, right? So I already checked all three of these. They're pretty much the same. The Maghrib one is more detailed, but just for the time, just for time's sake, we're gonna look at Wikipedia. So here we see his studies of Islamic tradition have taken him taken Suleiman across the Muslim world to countries including Jordan, UAE, and Malaysia. In addition to receiving traditional certification, Ijazat, in Islamic sciences, he received a bachelor's in Islamic law, master's in Islamic finance and political history, and completed a doctoral studies in Islamic thought and civilization at the International Islamic University of Malaysia. So we have four things going on here. We have Ijazat, he has Ijazat, which automatically uh, necessitates some sort of level of scholarship. You know, he has a bachelor's, Islamic law, master's in Islamic finance. In, in my humble opinion, a master's in Islamic finance is one of the most necessary sciences that we need here in the West. 
we're dealing with uh, interest rate um, based banks and Islamic finance is obviously much more powerful than any interest based banking system and that is so incredibly necessary in in the West right that's just a side note no and not many people have this type of credential I don't I, I, he's the only first one I've seen actually with a master's in it, Islamic finance. You know, there might be other people, Allahu Alam, but uh, it's, it's exceptionally necessary in the West. And uh, master's in uh, political history, Islamic political history, and uh, PhD in Islamic thought and civilization. So that, if you're fair, if you're fair, just this alone necessitates scholarship. Regardless of what you think or if you like Omar Suleiman or not, that proves that he went through some rigorous training to get these degrees. Most of us don't have anything remotely close to this. So yes, that necessitates scholarship. But let's dwell deeper. Let's see what Sheikh al Butoba had to say about... Um, Omar Suleiman's scholarship. Yeah, I, I just want to say this was actually the first point I wanted to mention because some uh, sincerely concerned younger brothers, uh, who I know personally, I see them as friends. I don't want to mention them by name, but they're, they're known, they have platforms online, and they do a lot of great work. But they seem to be very concerned, um, really, about you know your kind of understanding of who a scholar is. Um, because you said Omar Suleiman is a scholar, you said he's not. You said you have to memorize Quran to be a scholar, some say you don't. You know, the, the point here is that the, some, of the, some of the concerns which have been aired is, uh, you know, even you two can't agree here. You think you had a disagreement, or is it a disagreement? Can I? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, the issue of what makes up a scholar or who is a scholar has been an issue of ikhtilaf, even in the books of Usul, okay? Whether someone has to memorize the whole Quran or only the ayat of Ahkam, you know, these things, 500 ayat or Ahkam, and stories make up half Quran, you know, these things have been a, a discussion for many years. So when I said that Omar Suleiman is a scholar, I'm giving you my ruling on it. See, when a person has to set a certain standard, if you go to a particular college and they say, these are our qualifications for a bachelor's degree, there's no debate about that. That college has set a particular standard for what there is. I recognize that my people, the Westerners, are not familiar with what makes up, what are the qualifications, the minimal qualifications. And you know, I limited it to the, the minimal qualifications, okay? Because what I'm telling you is, whether it's agreed upon or not, it is al waqir It is actually what happens amongst the scholars. And to defend why I stated uh, Omar Suleiman, because even though it's not necessarily about Omar Suleiman, you have to know why we treat people differently. Omar Suleiman is not only a scholar, he comes from a family of scholars. His grandfather was the last Ottoman Mufti of, 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 of Jordan, okay? which is important because that was the greatest Islamic empire that we had. And then his father was one of the first professors in Medina University when it opened. Okay? And a student of Sheikh bin Baz and a companion of those. His father. His father. You know, in, in, in that area when it first opened. So he comes from a family of scholars. His, fa his father in law, I know I said earlier his father in law was Omar Suleiman. No, his father in law wasn't Omar Suleiman. But his father in law was an imam and a student of, uh, sorry, Omar, Sheikh Omar Ashkar. Okay? And Omar Ashkar was a student of his grandfather. So they're all like one family together. He's got his bachelor's degree in Islamic law from Jordan. You know, he's got a master's degree in Islamic finance and history. He's got a PhD from the University of Malaysia. Okay, in Islamic uh, sciences, I don't know exactly what he has a PhD. He's a hafiz of the Quran. Okay, he's a student of Sheikh Umar Ashkar. You know, Rahimahullah. This fulfills the, the minimum core requirements. And if we were, you know, what we have to do is give credit where it's due. I'm not saying that that wipes away his mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying. But we want to have some insult. So yeah, obviously after hearing that, uh, Omar Suleiman definitely has earned a level of respect. And this is the difference between. You know, regular people and and alim because the ulama they know who the ulama are. You know, they're scholars. They know who the scholars are because they're 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 in a different class than we are. Obviously, they're speaking to other scholars. They're going through it together, studying together, researching together. You know, people like us are on YouTube making YouTube videos. They don't do that. They have teams of people to make their YouTube videos for them but they don't go and watch other people's YouTube videos. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of the stuff that happens in our world, they're not going to know because they're just not doing that stuff. So when they say, oh, you know, how come the scholars aren't speaking? Because they're not doing what you're doing. They're advising you to not do what you're doing. You're still doing it anyway. And then when you get into problems, you're asking them, how come the other man don't solve our problems? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> right? So. But anyways, regardless of what we think about uh, Omar Suleiman, you know, 
And as I said, my personal opinion is just, it's just on the left side of the spectrum. That's what I think. But after saying that, even after saying that, you still have to give him res his respect as a scholar because he is one. How many of us can say that our grandfather is the last Mufti of the Ottoman Empire and from Jordan? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Our father taught in uh, Medina University and was a student of Sheikh Ibn Baz. How many of us can say something like this? Well, we're half of Quran. You know, how many uh, graduates from Medina University, you know, come back to us, they don't, haven't memorized the whole Quran yet because they're going there to get that degree. You see what I'm saying? So he's reached that level. If we're being fair, if we're being fair, we're going to say that he's reached that level. You understand? So with uh, the brother Danny Hakikachu now, now he prefaces his his whole, you know, spiel, right? By saying, how come nobody asked about Umar Sile, man? And we see how easy it was to find his credentials online. And Sheikh Abu Tobu gave details, details that wasn't even online, that which strengthens, you know, the level of knowledge that Umar Suleiman actually has and respect in the in that scholar community, which we are not a part of because we're on YouTube, right? <laughs> right? So, but anyways, uh, he prefaces it, right? And he says, well, how come nobody asked? Well, if we were to ask, we could find it. You see what I'm saying? So let's try to find Danny Hakikachu's scholarship. So same type of thing, Danny Hakikachu, Islamic credentials, and this is what comes up. You can see is nothing really. And here is he, he's taking a swipe again at uh, uh, Umar Suleiman, right? But what are his Islamic credentials talking about himself, right? says the respected imam who has done 20 separate speaking engagements with all kinds of feminist, liberal, reformist, LGBT, activist, co-panelist. So as you can see, you know, he's slighting um, Omar Suleiman. And he himself, he's not putting his level of Islamic studies out there. And there's a reason for that, right? Like you see someone like me now, I always tell you guys, you know, I don't know nothing. I'm a jahil. You know what I mean? I just tell everybody because people will respect that. You know what I mean? People will respect if you just be real with them. You know, just tell them, you know, if you know something, if you don't know something, right? Because then they can know what, what kind of questions to ask you. And I always tell you guys, I only do commentary. I don't make fatwa. I don't talk about uh, Islamic issues. You know what I mean? You don't see me teaching classes on the Sulat al or whatever, because there are other people much more qualified than me to do that stuff. I make commentary. You know, since I stopped talking about Troy and them, I've been talking specifically about racism and black issues, right? Because I feel that I have some expertise in this issue, in these issues. That's what I talk about. You see what I'm saying? So you don't see me going out and, you know, Doing all those jahl with that deal. This one's a mubtade. He's a doll. I don't do that nonsense, right? So, if you don't have scholarship, right, it's just easier to say it. Just say that, you know, you know, I don't have Islamic credentials. And people will respect that. You know what I'm saying? But if you're hiding, right, and then prefacing, your Islamic credentials before you actually say them, then there's a problem there. You know, it's not lying, but that's, you could say it's academically dishonest, right? And we'll get into detail in a minute, but let's hear from his own mouth what his Islamic credentials are. I, um, my credentials, I've never claimed that I'm a scholar. I've never claimed that I'm an alim. But I have studied uh, Islam. I have studied traditionally. Uh, I studied starting in my college years uh, in Boston. I studied with different teachers. I, you know, beginning with something like Tajweed, Tajweed of the Quran, Tafsir. I studied Fiqh. I studied uh, Zad al Mustaqni, uh, Hanbali Fiqh manual um, with a teacher for over a year. I've studied uh, basic Usul uh, in when I was in college and grad school, um, such as uh, Al Warqat from Imam Al Jawaini, for example. 
um, Sayyid Aqidah with a Jordanian Sheikh, Sheikh Imaduddin Abu Hijla. So uh, with Aqidah, that was also in college. College, I studied two years of Arabic. Uh, but then after college, after graduate school, I continued studying, studying Nahu Sarf, um, going through a book of tafsir, Imam Nasafi's tafsir, uh, focusing on Nahu and Balagha in, in that tafsir. And also studying fiqh, continuing studying fiqh right now, I'm studying Al-Hidayah, uh, Nur al ibah uh, in the Hanafi school with a sheikh, uh, studying Usul al-Shashi, continuing studying uh, Usul al-Fiqh basically, and also Hadith uh, and Quran. So these are Mashallah. studies that, like many people, like I'm a student, I'm just studying, yeah. I'm trying to improve myself, learn, uh, trying to master the Arabic language, it's, it's very challenging. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not like a, some people just have a language genius. But I don't have that. I, I really struggle. And alhamdulillah, you know, in total, I've studied five, almost six years of Arabic. And alhamdulillah, getting better, uh, getting a little bit more conversational, but basically yeah. trying to be able to understand comprehension, reading, no, and all no, of yeah. that. So as you can see that he clearly is not like a scholar, not even a student of knowledge, really. He studied for six years. He doesn't know Arabic, right? This is not like criticizing. And we hope that, inshallah, you know, Allah make it easier for him to get the language but six years if you're studying a language for six years and you don't know it then what you're really saying is that you're studying it part-time or occasionally over six years but he didn't say that and this is academically dishonest let's call it what it is all right <laughs> you know what i mean and this is typical of his style anyways right but we appreciate him telling and being forward about you know his credentials but he doesn't have any he's basically the the jonathan brown and brown of the alt-right you know he he and he's criticizing jonathan brown for his lack of islamic credentials while he himself doesn't have any so though we appreciate him being upfront and letting us know that you know he doesn't have credentials like that the point is is that we don't appreciate all the gaslighting he does all this type of ob objection blocking like how we've showed before in the other video this is his style it's very oriental-esque especially in his videos especially in his videos very oriental-esque you know and when this is what we're saying or not me but you know the shayuk they're saying that the way it's not what he's saying it's just the way that he's doing it because people with scholarship like Omar Suleiman have to be talked to to and with in a certain way because they've achieved that level that you haven't achieved six years and don't know Arabic. You see what I'm saying? So you have to speak with him with a certain level of respect. You know, when he did the refutation of Hamza Yusuf, I, I noticed that too. I, a brother sent it to me, a popular brother on YouTube, by the way, and I was like, you know, I didn't really um, like it because it was over the top, right? And But as, you know, I started reading his stuff and then watching his videos, I realized that this is his style, right? His style is like that very uh, oriental style, orientalist style, you see? So, you know, in terms of his his scholars and whatnot, you know, if you go online, he said, calls this person sheikh and that person sheikh, whatever. You know, he has this one sheikh that, you know, is clearly Haraji, but we can't say that these are his teachers. We can only go by what he says, right? So what he says, his, he only mentioned one person he studied with, and it's this person called Sheikh Imaduddin Abu Hijli, right? Uh, I've never heard of him before, right? So I had to go research him, right? Because that's, that's who he said he studied Akira with. Remember, remember, he studied Akira with Sheikh Imaduddin Abu Hijli. So who is Sheikh Imaduddin Abu Hijli? This is Sheikh Imaduddin Abu Hijli giving his 2014 Milad Nabi speech. This is Sheikh Imaduddin Abu Hijli's Ijazas. As you can see, he's got an Ijazah from Habib Omar, the, you know, Sufi guy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is Sheikh Imaduddin Abu Hijli's website. And as you can see, he's taught the brother Daniel Hakikachu Akida. And what Akida is it? Essential beliefs Akida within the two schools of thought. Ashari and Maturidi, and to so with. <laughs> okay. Problem. Problem. <laughs> not for me, not even for the brother Daniel, but for this guy. 
Danielle is basically not qualified. So for those of you who've already caught it, let me just explain to the people who didn't catch it, okay? These guys have a habit, okay? Always, you know, look to who you take from and be careful, the scholars of misguidance and blah, blah, blah. Well, here we have Brother Daniel Hakikuchu mentioning one teacher, only one, you know? Imadadin Apohijli, right? Who happens to be an Ashari Maturidi uh, Sufi, <laughs> okay? Teaching Daniel Kikuchu Akira. Big problem. Why? Because of this. Ya Akhi, Allah Yirdalek, tell me who from the ulama said that for you to start opening your mouth, you need to learn Quran, Arabic language, and fiqh. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about where did the Akira go? No Akira? No Akira? You begin with fiqh? Yeah, me too. Actually, we're all curious where did the Akira go? So. Can we study Ashari Maturi Akira and you'll give us, you know, the thumbs up as long as we start refuting Yaqeen Institute? <laughs> this is crazy. This is crazy. This is why some of these are a laughing stock because of stuff like this. But that's not all. He says there's certain adab you are supposed to have when you deal with a scholar, whether you like him or not, and whether sincere or collaborated. Again, a new principle. Uh, when you deal with a scholar, even if he's a, a scholar of misguidance, it doesn't matter. He's a scholar. Type it's a sincere mistake, collaborated, intentional mistake. It doesn't matter. You can't make this stuff up. You guys thought I was joking when I said they have a different standard for black people than other people. What do you think now? You think he's gonna go after uh, Sheikh Imadadin Abu Hijle, Daniel Hakikuchu's teacher? You think he's gonna go after him? The scholars of misguidance? The Ashari Maturidi Akira teacher of Daniel Hakikuchu. He's not going to do that. He's not going to call Daniel Hakikuchu a racist for his his his, his uh, alt, all right uh, affiliations. And we won't do that. That's for us. All that language and vitriol is for us and us only. You know, get with the program. So when somebody like me doesn't take it, they can't stand it. When somebody like me points out all the hypocrisy in their dawah, Omar Suleiman is Sheikh of Misguidance. Okay, what about Daniel Kikachu who studied from Sheikh of Misguidance? And you're pushing him on top of that. And you're pushing him because you have an agenda against Yaqeen. So when it comes to your menhaj, you will become Ikhwani in order to get rid of... <laughs> You know, your opponent. So you're murji with yourselves and Khariji with the other Muslims. You see how that works? It's a game. It's one big team sport dawa game. This is what these people do. You thought I was playing, thought I was joking. I'm not joking. I've been around the block a long time. I know what I'm talking about. What you gonna say now? What you gonna say now? You got yourself in a big <laughs> problem. You watch, they're not gonna say anything. I'm just gonna remain silent, find all probably maybe hundred trolls or so on my comments or whatever, you know, that's about it. The same old, same old as usual, you know, truth hurts. So they got to, you know, burn off some steam in the comments. What do you want me to say? That uh, Imad Adina Pohichli is not Daniel Hakikuchu's teacher? Anyways, I came to you in peace. I leave you in peace. Please subscribe. Please share. Please like. And please hit me up on Patreon. You, this is not easy doing this stuff. These guys, you know, especially this group here, put a lot of pressure on me. A lot of pressure on me. But, why well, I got to be afraid of them when I have a lot to be afraid of? I don't care what they say. Let them refute what I'm just saying right now. I dare them. Anyways, Subhanakul or Humdik, Mashallah and Still work a word to be like, uh, I leave you in peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I knew this question was coming and I waited until someone asked it nicely to respond. So no, there's no such thing as white pride, in part because there is no white culture. You can have pride based on your ethnicity, like Scottish, German, Irish. You can even have regional pride, like Southern pride. These things usually apply to your cultural identity, like how you grew up, etc. And I had some people argue, well, other colors have pride, and no, they don't. Chicano, Latino pride, Asian pride, those are not colors. The one exception 
is black pride. And that's because they've had a unique experience no one else has. Black Americans were robbed of their culture. They don't know where they come from. Two black Americans meet. They could have come from warring African tribes. They don't know. What they do know is their American experience was similar. In other words, the thing that connects them is the color of their skin and how society has treated them as a result. You also have to consider where the terms white pride and black pride originate. White pride was coined by white supremacists. Black pride is from the black power and civil rights movement. So one represents superiority and hate, and the other a fight for equality. 